We move on to the installation of the automation engine. First, we copy the compressed tar file to a directory called automation engine. We focus on the contents of the bin directory. There, you find a configuration file ucsrv.ini. There's a number of settings we need to consider, like the ODBC var string and TLS. All database packages use Java functions, which means the automation engine needs a JDBC driver. We'll configure the JDBC connection to the database and then download the PostgreSQL JDBC driver and make it available to AE. A PostgreSQL client is also needed on the AE host. It communicates with the database server on the DB host. Finally, we'll test AE by starting some of the processes. We provide a brief explanation of what each process does, although Atomic has released a course on AE processes, which we recommend you take. Let's look at the architecture diagram. We're installing the AE processes on the AE host. It has a configuration file, ucsrv.ini. It needs the JDBC driver and the PostgreSQL clients. Let's start with the installation of AE. All the usual assumptions regarding Java and the install package still apply. We've created a directory called Automation Engine with capitalized first letters. We copy the UCS LX6.tar.gz from the installation package. As for other components, make sure you grab the right file based on your operating system and distribution. Then we'll unzip the file and untar. The bin directory contains a bunch of libraries with the SO extension. You can ignore them. We need to explain four key files. UCSRV.ORI.ini is the configuration file, which has to be renamed UCSRV.ini. We have two executables. UCSRVCP starts the CP process. CP stands for Standard Non-Java-Based Communications. It handles a number of tasks, like incoming non-TLS aging connections. UCSRV WP starts the work processes. They assume standard workload responsibilities like batch executions. Then there's the UCSRV JP file, which is the executable for all Java-based processes. We use this to start the JCP, JWP, and REST. JCP handles TLS and Java-based comms. JWP handles Java-based workload tasks like the monitoring page and the web interface, and REST handles the REST API, which we do not cover in this course. UCSRV.ini is the configuration file. It contains many configuration settings. The first is the system name, which is chiefly important. It sets the name of the entire Atomic instance, and the other components like Agents and AWI rely on it for AE connections, so it has to be consistent. Atomic administrators use this to differentiate system types, say test, QA, or prod. The hostname setting should be set to the AE hostname. This information will be made public to the other components, which facilitates component connections. Use cp.ports to set hard ports for your CPs. In our case, it's not critical because we only have one instance of AE. But in configurations involving multiple instances or clusters, hard CP port ranges must be set for each AE so they don't overlap, which can cause severe malfunctions. ws.port is the port range for the secure web sockets associated with the JCP. TLS components like AWI use the JCP for the initial connection to AE, and it becomes important where multiple instances and cluster configurations exist. We can leave this alone, but in the future, we'll use the port for our agents and AWI connections. Finally, we have two SQL Driver Connect settings. This should make sense. The automation engine's data assets are stored in the database, and AE connects to the database via ODBC and JDBC. We've already covered ODBC var in the utilities video. That string will be exactly the same. It can be copied from ucbdbld.ini. We'll explain the JDBC var connection. ucsrv.ini also stores TLS settings found in the TLS section of the file. You set the name, location, and password of the key store we created and copied on the host. The same goes for the key pair password and alias. If you'd like to avoid setting clear passwords, 
Atomic has a proprietary encryption tool called UCB Crypt, and the documentation and TLS course explain how it works. When you enter clear passwords, they're automatically encrypted when you save the file. But you can also encrypt them first with a tool, which is something we recommend, especially if more than one person is going to be working on UCSRV.ini. This is the code snippet for the UCSRV.ini file. First, we rename it. Then we configure it. We're setting the system name. This will have to be consistent across the entire instance. We set the host name. We can copy the ODBC var connection from the DB load configuration file, ucbdbld.ini. We set the JDBC var string. You have to provide the database package, the DB host, the port, and the name of the database. Finally, we set the TLS settings. We need the appropriate JDBC driver for the database package. The best way to do this is to download the right version from the provider's website, Oracle, Microsoft, or PostgreSQL. We'll do this for PostgreSQL. We have to store it in the lib directory under bin. The file should be in your downloads directory. You just move it to lib. In the case of PostgreSQL, we'll change the mod to 644 as per the instructions found on the PostgreSQL website. Just follow the recommendations provided by the DB package vendor. The need for a database client varies from one provider to the next, and it's best to check the documentation for this. In our case, we have to install the PostgreSQL clients on the AE hosts. We've already done this once for the DB host. The client has dependencies on the libraries, so you should download the repositories in this order. AE has been installed and configured, and the other technical requirements are met. We can start some of the processes to see if they work. Failures can be the result of a variety of issues like a typo in the ODBC var string or a bad TLS setup. Always check the logs in the temp directory to figure it out. The start order matters, but it's quite easy. The one constant is the WP, which always starts first. This tracks back to the initiating of the Atomic database, and this isn't something we cover here. REST can start at the end. It's best to start JWP after the CPs and JCPs, but before REST. The order between CPs and JCPs is an importance, unless agent reconnection times are a factor. TLS agents connect over JCP, while non-TLS agents use CPs. Depending on the proportion of each, you may want to prioritize one over the other. Again, we don't cover this here. To start processes, we execute from the executable's location. For all processes, we use the dash "-i", -I option to specify the ucsrv.ini file unless the executable and the INI are in the same location, which is generally the case. They're both in the bin directory. Using dash I is still good practice. JCP and JWP are started via java-jar and the ucsrvjp.jar file. To start the JCP, use dash CP as an end option. JWP has no option. Finally, to start rests, we use the same command in jar file, but with the dash rest option. For the purposes of this course, we won't start this process. We have two windows. On the right, we start processes in a term window. On the left, we use a file explorer to show A's temp directory, where a log is generated when a process starts. A short process acronym with a number tells you your process started normally. If the log is longer with several digits, then there's a problem and you should troubleshoot.
the log displays the process name, towards the bottom the presence of the text string ready for run, as well as the absence of error messages like an abnormal stop, is a good indication that the AE configuration is sound.